Hola a todos, es un gusto estar con ustedes. Bueno, en esta ocasión vamos a tener una muy, pero muy interesante plática académica con el profesor Paolo Valerio, considerado una institución a nivel de la psiquiatría, la psicología y el género en Italia. Él trabaja en Nápoles y bueno, vamos a empezar a ver unos temas muy importantes para los psiquiatras actuales, los psiquiatras contemporáneos. Vamos a ver la perspectiva desde Italia y las recomendaciones que nos va a dar. Ok, es un gusto. Hi, Professor Paolo. Nice to see you, nice to have with us. Could you tell us a little bit about your uh, professionalization and your formation, please? Yes, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to share with you my experience. As you know, I am 72 years old. And when I graduated in medicine in 1972, in Italy, there did not exist any faculty of psychology. And uh, to become, and the, there was a school of specialization that last three years called mental and nervous diseases. After which you were appointed as a neuropsychiatrist. Then later on, psychiatry and neurology sh shared and started the school specialization of neurology and school specialization in psychiatry. But in my time, there was only one. So I started as a neuropsychiatrist working in the field of, well, my, 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 uh, my career was very long and very complicated, I would say, because my, my thesis was on uh, the, Uh, transferable tumors uh, on, of thyroids. Then I worked on uh, Alice Fatasia, dystrophia, leco, uh, leco dystrophia, uh, dystrophia, leco dystrophia, well, a long time ago, I think. Yeah. But then I understood that, well, I was more interested in social issues, so I started working as a neurologist in the clinical nerve mental diseases in the field of uh, epilepsy, taking care of social aspect of epilepsy. And so this, I started also being in touch with psychology and I made some research on, uh, from the point of view of uh, psychology and medicine. And after that, I started also my training as a psychotherapeutic psychoanalyst. And it was offered me a position in the faculty of medicine as a psychologist, because in Italy then you could also start a career as a psychologist being a medical doctor. Now, nowadays it's not possible. So I started working on medicine as a, a clinical psychologist psychologist with a orientation towards uh, psychodynamic practice or psychodynamic oriented practice. And my first work, for instance, were on psychodynamic counseling, how to work on a very short time on psychoanalytic uh, principles. Okay, no, so that's a big career, as you said. Um, For us uh, in Mexico, we know that in Europe, the history of psychiatry, the old development of the movements that you guys have there is like, for us, it's history. But as you said, you've been studying this for a while. So what do you talk, uh, do you want to talk us a little bit about Besaglia, about that movement? Uh, I think you were around this, this situation in Italy, please. I remember very well those days. I remember when there was a uh, manicomio. And for instance, I remember the lecture of psychiatric semiotics in the manicomio where the professor showed the patient with his uh, delirium. I mean, it was very sad time. That. But that movement was very important as uh, it's testified all over the world. Because for the first time, someone started seeing that 
patients with mental diseases were not people who were to be contained in a hospital like a prison, but who should be cured. Before, at least in Italy, there was first containment, but containment as jail, then therapy, but well, there was quite no therapy. And so we, I remember the movement when very many young psychiatrists were in North Italy, to Trieste and Gorizia, where the movement started. And then there was a referendum, and then was a law that closed all the uh, manicomi, mental hospitals, with a new law. Of course, the problem with mental diseases is that um, you need a very important and strong social support. So in those places, and unfortunately this, this happened more in North Italy than in South Italy, where there was uh, also a political movement on the left, the organized center of uh, mental health and houses for the patients. Nowadays, uh, it's a sad situation, but uh, the big uh, weight is uh, on the families. Okay, uh, we, we talk about a little bit of that. It's kind of the similar situation in Mexico, like uh, the family has to, to, to take care of the patient, right? For the psychiatric patient, you might say. Uh, but in, and after that, so what is your opinion about psychiatry now in Italy after, after that movement about, it was called democratic psychiatry, right? Democratic, yes. yes. Still, there is uh, some work on uh, psychiatric, uh, say, democratic, and this movement now is all, uh, is, uh, all uh, in the direction of close also the manicomio judiciari, the, the manicomio for people who made. Uh, um, something against the law, homicides and so on. They're still open and the situation is very sad. As far as the Italy situation, uh, I trained also as clinical psychologist, uh, uh, young psychiatrist. And one thing I, am, I have to say that uh, the training now of young generation psychiatrist is more developed towards medicalization. I mean, uh, uh, of course, drugs are useful. Drugs are something psycho, uh, uh, psychopharma, uh, psychopharmacy are really uh, could be very useful. But a patient with mental disease or any person who needs a psychiatric help needs also someone who is able to listen to him, to contain his anguish, to contain his anxieties. And very often, at least in Italy, I don't know what's the situation in Mexico, our young psychiatrists are not trained in order to contain the mental pain of patients with mental diseases. They are not trained to do a good uh, uh, clinical, uh, colloquial clinical, uh, well, what's the for that? Um, well, to speak to the patient in order to contain their anxiety. Because patients need, of course, drugs. But drug is not enough. And also there is the risk also of hyper-medicalization. I mean, if I lose my mother, and I feel depressed, but I am really depressed, or I am just sad. The problem is that we live in an area, in a time where people don't accept sadness. If you say that you are depressed, okay, go to doctor, doctor will, do a, will give you a good drug. If you say, say, I am sad, well, everybody say, don't think, oh, no problem, go to the beach, uh, go and buy something. And this is a big problem because people need someone who can hear them, contain them, their uh, anxiety, and also we are thinking now about mourning, 
the process of mourning. And very often it's not easy to find someone who is ready to help people working through mourning. And also patients sometimes would prefer to quickly end the problem. Before the society, at least in Italy, had some social uh, rituals. I mean, uh, after the death of a pair of someone important, uh, you could stay at home for a long time, and you were not supposed to go to, to parties. Uh, now it, all this has changed. Uh, it is as if death is something that you can really consider, but we, we have to consider that. Uh, so you mean uh, the society now we de we deny an uh, important part of of our feelings like the sadness like the uh, you know the mourning uh, all those stuff. Also, I wanted to ask you this like could be called the second topic about what do you think about mm, this problem is is going on with the medical residents? Okay, how do they cope with this? situation, as you said, with the sadness of the patients, with the death of the patients, with their own uh, feelings and emotions. What do you think about the situation? Because now in Mexico, we see some suicides of medical residents, of pedi uh, pediatry, or, I mean children, doctors, uh, surgeons, anesthesiology, even psychiatrists. So what do you think about this part, uh, what you can say. Well, it could be a very long discourse. I mean, one of the problems of human beings is how to cope with changes. And the first catastrophic change in our life is death when the first time human being is out of the protective body of the mother, he starts feeling everything, but also start, starts feeling something new, unknown. And this means that, well, the little baby needs the containment of the mother and also is organized in order to cope with all the needs linked link to the changes. I mean, to find all the solutions in order to survive the changes. Emotion speaking, of course, I'm saying. And change is something very important. Then we we'll understand why I started with changes speaking about the training of American doctors. And um, also we have started thinking something, that in the last century we have started a lot to pray. We start thinking, knowing quite enough about brain. But we still do not know enough about mind. And we do not know enough about the mind-brain relationship. I mean, we do not know how can few neurons a group of neurons who are materia, who are weightable, feel as emotions have uh, uh, links like link to subjectivity. If I am religious, well, it's easy. It's got suke, soul. If I am like a scientist, I say, I don't know. We have to accept our links. Still, we do not have any reply to the Cartesian question about the, the relation between res cogitant and res extensa. But we know that God and mind are something interwined and thought and culture and nature are also interwined. And all the Results so of what we are come from the interaction of the relationship between culture and nature. So, when we have the baby, we have to cope with changes and we find the solutions. 
Well, speaking from the Sanguinga point of view, I'm speaking about uh, defense mechanisms. If I would to speak from the cognitive point of view, I would say uh, coping devices. Coping devices, mechanisms, uh, uh, defense mechanisms, and the solutions the mind finds in order to cope with changes and survive emotionally. I do not want to say that if we uh, like the cognitive theory or cyber uh, theory, because what we learn from science is that uh, mind is such a very complex uh, concept that we that one theory is not enough to explain all the, the functions of mind. Of course, also we cannot accept a sort of frigid ecclesiastical. So also we need to find one of the theory. As far as I am involved. Well, uh, as I told before, I am psychoanalytic oriented. And speaking about this, this means that when we cope with uh, changes, we have to find through our mechanism, definite mechanism, the solution, our mental solution in order to survive. And those solutions that we, we found where, when we were little babies, are the solution we will find later in time. What do I mean? I mean that the first day of school, the first day of university, the first day of uh, retirement, offer us the possibility to be coped through those mechanisms that we found when we were to survive emotion, when we were young, little baby, and we lost the sight of our mother. So, coming back to medical-doctor relationship, what has happened to a young student who starts studying medicine? It happened something very interesting. He will do a training, very different from the training or his other friends, or colleague in your school, because for the first time in his life, he will be very soon in touch with concept of life and death, while his friends who study philosophy, who study biology, who study uh, architecture, you know, take care of this. If he, he studied at in a medical school, he studied in hospital very soon in, in touch with, with uh, patients, with uh, the concept of life and death. And uh, this change is attitude. And also this, this changes the way of thinking, because it needs to survive, it needs emotionally. I want just to, to say something that, uh, well, about my biography. I was on first year of medicine. In those days, we had to do autopsy to study muscles and nerves uh, in, uh, in a laboratory. Uh, and there was a loan who was studying the muscle of uh, an arm. When I arrived to, to the nails, I was thirsty. For the first time, I understood it was not only the lactic material, as they told me. Was part of a man who was dead now. I was horrified. I stopped doing it. I went home. I studied on the books, but did not went back and made a topsy. I passed the exam also with a good, good mark, the maximum. But then, about uh, seven or eight years later, when I started my study in uh, mental diseases and then to, to study brain, I understood it was that something very strange happened to me because I could not understand the ventricular how were uh, in the brain. And I understood suddenly that I studied a biodimensional medicine as if it was all written on a book and it was a whole body. So, my defense mechanism was to uh, devitalize a 
transform to everything not in dimension but in my dimension. I mean, I don't know what, maybe this is why now I am a psychologist or my identity is very strange or uh, medical doctor, psychiatrist who teaches me clinical psychology in a medical school. So you see, a doctor, a student, or medicine needs space where they can express emotions. Because also the emotion linked to the uh, next body, for instance. They say, Oh, you are a doctor, uh, uh, the patient can be negative. There, are, there could be some sexual fantasies, emotional fantasies, and offer the student a space where to speak about this. I think it could be something useful. Otherwise, denial is the only possibility. As denial was for me the possibility in those days. But considering death, and uh, studying medicine as on a bio-dimensional dimension. So, training in medical doctor is a very complex training because they must learn from techie point of view very important notions in biology, in physics, in medicine, physiology, pathology. But also they should know a lot about communication. And communication skills cannot be learned reading books, but they should be learned through direct experiences. That's why I think that our programs should offer to our students many, much more opportunities to learn how to cope with a person in order to communicate in the best way, and a good communication is not only useful for the patient, but also useful for the medical doctor, because if you communicate well, you feel satisfied as a person and as a technician. Okay, you might say we have uh, like medical students or residents, now we have difficulties to cope, we have mostly denial and repressional mechanism and that's why we get all the situations more troublesome we cannot communicate with the patients properly or we might take a very uh, very important distance to them even emotional and physical and also with our companions that might be one of the uh, genesis factors of this situation with the medical formation mm. 